morning. Next it's supposed to get down into next week. 30, 29, or 30 degrees. Mm. There's snow on Tuesday. What? Snow. Rain and snow, snow showers uh -huh. tonight. Unacceptable. That sounds about right. That's about but right. But then it's supposed to be in the 60s till the weekend. Uh-huh. Yeah, so. Like next weekend, it's supposed to be yeah. really nice. Again. So, hey, it's a change of season. Yeah. So, uh. Um, just a couple of things. Make sure you, you get your bulletin. Uh, Bev Thornburg uh, is currently in a rehab center, and uh, there are some needs for her you know, listed in the bulletin. And so uh, we'd like to help help our sister out there. Um, tonight, after services, there's supposed to be a surprise graduation party for Josh. He's he's here, and not supposed to know it. It's just a little gathering and stuff. I asked Larry, and he goes, "Nothing special. It's just gonna happen." I goes, "Oh, cool! Another excuse to have cake." <laughs> so yeah, so there'll be a, a gathering after afterwards uh, for him. So. Uh, and uh, when you guys leave in Wednesday, yep. what are we doing for Wednesday night, Randy? Okay. Right. Cake. We're having cake. We're having cake. <laughs> Leftover <laughs> cake. All right. No celebrating beefs. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, make sure you uh, make sure you get your bulletin and uh, and look it over. A lot of things going on. <clears throat> All, I'm already getting excited for the Bible Bowl bash, but the apple butter, the apple butter festivities next month too. While well, thinking about our uh, trip, trunk or treat coming up uh, in about two weeks, three weeks, something like that. Soon, soon. So let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the night's rest, um, for the body's ability to rejuvenate itself. We thank you for the beauty of the morning and the ability that we have to arise and to go about those things that uh, we would like to, especially today, Father, as we prepare for um, worshiping and studying together to you. We ask your blessings upon those who are sick and hurting, and we pray that we can be an encouragement to them. We also pray, Father, that we would have a better understanding of the messages that are taught this morning, both in Romans and in the pulpit, that we give all honor, glory, and praise to you, and that we become humble um, and gentle servants. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So... We are now in Romans, actually 14, but we're going to cover the tail end of 13. Uh, we didn't cover last week. Now, there's going to be a few, uh, I guess they say caveats in, uh, in 14. I just we'll see what happens, how far we get with it if we get stuck. Last week, um, <clears throat> when Jonathan was here, <clears throat> excuse me, we had talked about we had a lot of things come up. We were chasing rabbits all, just all, all the class, and, and Jonathan told his grandma, he says, tell grandpa to put the shovel down. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, last week's class I thought was, was very good. So our scripture reading is coming from Romans chapter 14, verses seven and eight. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. Now, when we look at that passage, what's that passage telling us? There's, a, there's some good lessons you can draw out of that passage. And... Being that it's early in the morning, well, somewhat early, 
it's kind of hard to stimulate the brain to think about, all right, what's he telling me there? I think in order to understand what that passage says, you have to go into the text and see exactly uh, what... Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> to see exactly what, what he's telling us. The, the, one, the one lesson I get is that we're not an island. Man was meant to be a social being. And so as Christians, we are to, well, let our light shine. We are to socialize with fellow Christians, but also with people of the world so that we might be able to give them the message that God intended. But let's move on. So last week, you know what? They must have upgraded that program because that computer didn't do that before. Last week, we covered uh, chapter 13, and this is just kind of the highlight. So the first part of that chapter, we talked about believers and authorities, and that was actually from verse 1 to verse uh, 7. And the thing that we get out of that, that grouping is the fact that we are to be in subjection to the authorities. We are to pay our taxes. We are to give honor where honor is due. And, uh, and, and because there is a reason, and, and he lists those in the fact that if we obey the laws of the land, we don't have to fear those who are in position of authority. And so, uh, but if we disobey, then we do have to fear. Last night I was looking at uh, uh, Crazy Drivers or something like that. Oh, yeah. you ever watch those? Oh yeah. Yeah. I like the one that watch the ones I think I'm on there. I like to watch the ones that are instant karma. Okay, so uh, you know, these drivers do these crazy things and all of a sudden out of nowhere there's a police car going right after them. And the driver, because he has a dash cam, starts laughing. Okay? So if somebody passes us or does something cruel to us or you know, is an aggressive driver and then you get instant karma, you know as long as they don't get hurt. Uh, I remember a guy doing that to me. Well, I was on the interstate coming home and it was very snowy and icy. And I was going up that hill <coughs> just south of Bolivar. And I seen a guy really coming, coming hard in the passing lane and that's where I was. So I gently moved over to let him go by. I don't know how he was doing it, but he never did pass me. He ended up in the median strip. So, instant karma. You're driving, you know. But anyway, I digress. We're to be in subjection. If you want to break the law, what is it? If you're going to play, you're going to pay. And so, and if, if, you, if you don't pay in this life, you will pay in the next. And so we have to be mindful of that. The other thing is that we find out that we are strangers and aliens in this world. Remember, we're in the world, but not of the world. The, the church is the call out. And even though we have uh, rulers and powers, what we have to watch out for is the principality and powers from, you know, Satan. But we are to be in subjection. Now, he also talks about a master. Who's our master? As a Christian, who was our master? Christ. God the Father. God. He's our master. So the passage that we read at the beginning, if we live or we die, we die to the Lord, that's what we have to keep in mind. The other thing is, the Lord is the one that's going to make us stand. And then finally, we are subject to the king of kings. So we are, we are in his kingdom and we are his subjects and we obey his commands. The other thing we got into was civil disobedience. And we talked about some of that and we follow the, the, the laws of the land if we have a problem um, to try and change things. And we've seen that example with John and Paul in front of the Sanhedrin. You know, hey, you know, 
are, are you going to obey God or are you going to obey man? We can't obey man. We have to obey what God said. And they reasoned with them. So they beat them up and then sent them on their way. All right. The second part was believers in our fellow men. Now this would involve not only Christians, but also those outside the world. And we see the first thing he says is, oh, nothing. And, you know, what comes to mind is debt. Is financial debt, but I think it it, it deals more um, with personal things too. I mean, if you look at a, a lot of Americans today, I don't know what the percentage would be that, that we're in debt. Why do you have all these commercials about how to get out of debt? Okay, all these companies are trying to get us out of debt. Terry, I read an article I've seen on TV a while back. It said that. The middle class, if they had to pay an extra bill at 500 bucks a month, couldn't come up with the money. Mm -hmm. That's how far we're into things. Yeah. And the sad part is things don't make us happy. No. I don't care how much money. I no. said this before too. I read an article where it said if you made 50 or 60,000, the people that made Millions and whatever are no more happier than you if you watch how you spend your money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we see that. We can see that. We can see celebrities <coughs> losing everything. Yeah, so it's not things. Uh, and then he concludes that section with love. You have to love. And he also mentions, and this is uh, 8 through 10, he says, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And what do I have here? It is. I can't read my own printing. It is. Oh, that's a distinguishing mark of a Christian. Okay? Love is this a distinguishing mark. And I think this is where we left off last week. So, by your love for one another, the world will know that you are my disciples. Okay. So how is that love supposed to convey itself, not only to our brothers and sisters in Christ, but those around about us? How, is it, how are we supposed to do that? What are we to do? Have any examples? I hear crickets. Put others above ourselves or before ourselves. Yeah. You know what? And, and that's, I think that's kind of the theme of what he's getting to as we look at 13, 14, and 15. Because <coughs> what was the whole purpose of him writing to the Romans? Unify the church. Unify the church. And, and he's actually going through that. He, he covered all this, the, 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 the foreground in the first, you know, first chapters. And now we're getting into the meat of it. And he says, love. 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 All right. What's the love chapter? First Corinthians 13. Yeah. All right. So, believers in the last days is uh, 13 through 11, 14. And I think, yeah, here it is. Now, this is from the uh, New American Standard Version. So he's, he's concluding all this. And he says, doing this, <coughs> knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than we when we first believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, there's, what's this therefore? Let's rid ourselves of the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let's behave properly as in the day not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and debauchery, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. So we're going to look at this passage, and we're going to, we're going to take it apart a little bit, and then get into 14. So he's telling us a lot of things. So the first thing that he says to us is, Notice the question, what is Paul telling us and the brethren, or the brethren and us? Uh, we are to awaken. Now, he mentions the last days. 
What's he talking about here? And why does he tell him to wake up? Again, you got Christian Jews, Christian Gentiles, and he's telling them to wake up. What, what, what do you suppose is the purpose of him saying that? He says it. He says it um, uh, tactfully. And then he said something about salvation is near. It's nearer than when you first believe. What's he getting at there? Wake up, man. <clears throat> Get ready because the day's coming. Snap, <laughs> snap out of it. Snap out of it. Well, you're arguing about stuff that, you know. What good does it do? What's that? My what good does it do? Yeah, wake up. Sometimes you argue about things that really. <laughs> we're, we're in the. Now, when he says the last day, what's he referring to there? Now, when you, when you hear, like Jonathan said, Jonathan asked me, Grandpa, what's this last days? Does that mean Jesus is coming real soon? And I'm going, in his time. He said, yeah, but I'm young. I want to live my life. <laughs> okay? So, you know, we get it from a, a, a young person's perspective versus someone who is middle-aged or older. But when we hear the, in the scriptures, when we talk about the last days, what, what is... What are we referring to? Christ coming the second time. Yeah. Back to we're in we're in the last dispensation of time. And what were those dispensations? We had we had the patriarchs, mm -hmm. right? Then we had Moses. Moses. And now we have Christ, Christ which is the last days and Jesus even mentioned the last days and and it went so far as to uh, Paul had to admonish the Thessalonians that they were selling everything and just waiting for him to come okay so we're still in the last days 2,000 years ago now why hasn't God showed up yet it's not his time it's not his time it's not his time, but he's telling them, okay, awaken. And he says, uh, uh, let's see here. Salvation is nearer to us than when we, when we believe, when we first believe. But what is he saying there with that one? In other words, they've already believed. They've already obeyed the gospel. But now he's saying uh, it, it's near. Time is coming when your salvation will be fully realized. Your, your life here is going to end. You're going to enter into a new one. Okay. Well, persecution, of course. And Nero was the governing authority at that time when this was written. Um, all right. And then he goes on to say, The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Now, so he's using... And then he uses darkness, the deeds of darkness. So in, in his explanation there, the Romans, just like the Greeks, they had, uh, their culture was, they had a lot of gods. And uh, they, you know, they worshiped all these gods. And with these gods, they also had the promiscuity, they had, you know, they were, the, the Romans were known for their, their orgies and their drunken parties and, and uh, uh, what do they call, all oh, the temple prostitutes, etc. So you had sexual promiscuity. Um, but when does all this happen? As far as the time of day, when does it happen? 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, 
for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Okay, that's Jesus giving the church to his father. That's when he, that's his second coming. And so it's all given to his father, his bride. So, but in during the day, do you see a lot of crime during the day? Is that one of yours? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, but then he goes, he goes on to say, Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, as in behave properly as in the day. Now, you might see some crime going on during the day, but a lot of it happens during the night. You ever see a drunk in the middle of the day? Most of the time. I mean, most of the time. You'll see them, but not, not as much as... When do most parties happen? In the evening. Okay? Um, and then he goes on and he says, uh, he says some other things. So, we're to wake up. As Christians, we are to wake up. We are in the last days. We have no idea when Jesus is going to come. It could be tomorrow. It could be today. Here. And then he's saying, let's walk properly all the time, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. Even at night, when all these things happen, we still have to walk properly and not do as they do. What does Peter tell us about the devil and how are we to behave? He walks back and forth on the earth as a roaring lion. Yeah, so, time consumed from so, the so if you're not drunk, you're what? Sober. 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 Be sober. Be vigilant. Because the other thing is, he tells us here to put on the armor. So, in a sense, we are all soldiers. We have volunteered for this service. And so, we're in the service of the Lord. Mike, you got a clue? I, I can see some smoke starting to come out of there. That's, that's dust. Okay. I'm good. All right. Okay. So, in, sec, in Ephesians 6 through 10, he, he says something here. He says, uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, he mentions, oh, in verse 12. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Okay. So that struck a chord, and you go to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Here he gives us the tools, the full armor. We are to clothe ourselves with that. And we've heard a lot of lessons based on putting on the armor of God. But the only way to do that is to become familiar with God's words so that we can put on that armor. Because it's, it's one, armor is used as a protection. Now, I was watching, I was telling you, I was watching that Merlin series about King Arthur. And I see these guys, you know, they're wielding their long swords and, you know, they're cutting these guys down left and right. But if you're wearing armor, how does that work? Chain mail? I can see it. An arrow will pierce chain mail. But not that. Terry? Uh, it says, study to show thyself. Prove the workman unto God and use not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I believe that's in Timothy. That's Second Timothy two fifteen. Yeah. yeah. So the, the only the only way we can put that armor on is to study. Then you have to learn how to use it. You're not going to put a helmet on your foot. It's rightly dividing. <laughs> yeah. What's that? You can. It just won't fit. It just won't fit. Yeah. Rightly dividing. <laughs> In other words, having perception, how to how to know, and, and this basically is what we're trying to do here. Ever this is, studying and ever coming to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah, that's sad. Uh huh. Well, that's what Paul was talking about with his fellow Hebrews. They have a zeal without knowledge. So we put on the full armor of God. We wield the sword. The shield is to protect us. Uh, the breastplate of righteousness. I mean, all these things. And then the other thing is, 
We are to behave properly. Terry just mentioned that. You have to behave yourself. Okay? Uh, we go to verse 13. Let's behave properly as in the day. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and mockery, not in strife and jealousy. Well, with the church, we know that they had strife and jealousy. Because one group says this, one group says that. One group says, we have a Lord, you don't. And then God says, wait a minute. <laughs> In the beginning of Romans, he says that. But as far as the promiscuity and debauchery, it was there. It was there. Even in Corinth, it was there. So it's growing in Christ. But then he also tells us that we are to put on Christ. He had mentioned that earlier in Romans chapter 6. As we were buried in the likeness of his death, we are raised in the likeness of his resurrection. And in Galatians 3.27, I think that was written before Romans. I think. But what's that tell us? What's, what's Galatians 3.27 tell us? All sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for as many of us have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay. See what's going on in the picture? We put on Christ. That's like wearing the blood of the Lamb. That's like having our, our, our doorpost and lentil covered with the blood of Jesus. When we're baptized, we're actually baptized with him, from what I read, actually. We are baptized in his death, mm -hmm. actually in that mm -hmm. process, with him. Mm -hmm. You're buried. Yeah, we're not on our own. We're with him in that baptism. When you, let's see, Butch, when you and I joined the service, there was all these papers. And right before we, we made that commitment, we had to do one last thing. Do you remember what that was? <clears throat> yes, sir. <laughs> you had this little instrument in your hand, and you had to put your signature down there because you just now signed a contract that you will be subject and serve the government for a period of, you know, four years, and then you have a chance to renew. But you've signed that contract. As Christians, when we're baptized into Christ, we've now made a commitment. And that's a lifelong commitment. And the problem is, some go AWOL, some desert. And that's the problem that we have. But as Christians, we try to go after those sheep. Now, in the military, if you do that, you're looking at prison time once they catch you. Jason told me that. Jason says, Dad, this was the night he had just left. He was in Cleveland waiting to go to the Great Lakes. He called me and says, Dad, I don't think I can do this. And I'm saying, son, you don't have a choice now. You have signed a contract. Yeah, you can come home. But they're going to send those guys over and they're going to pick you up and drag you right back. So you have signed a contract. We have made a commitment to our Lord. We are to make no provisions for the flesh. What's he talking about there? Provisions for the flesh? Is he talking about clothes? Food, shelter, water. Worldly. Yeah, what would what would those worldly provisions be? No provisions. Now you have to look at what the passage, what we what we first what we first read. He says. Um, Drunkenness, sexual promiscuity, sensuality, strife, jealousy. Okay? Those are sexual uh, provisions. Those are, those are provisions for the flesh. But there's some other ones, too, and we'll look at that in 14 if we have time. 
So then, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.22. 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Oops, too far. Who has it? Okay. Abstain from every form of evil. All right. How? Remember, we said in, in Peter, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may to devour. This lion is never satisfied. He wants more. Just like us. More riches. More things. But as Christians, we have a different focus. So how does this happen? Well, we're refraining from the appearances of evil. And, and again, we have another lesson. So the first thing is, this is what one of the, uh, this is an article that I had read and I put it up here. Separating ourselves from all sorts of evil does not only refer to worldly activities like <coughs> lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the pursuit of ungodly works of darkness. We separate ourselves from those things, but that's enough of a battle, a lifetime battle as a soldier in Christ. Because we're constantly in it. You got something, Eric? Yeah. Um, it, when you say uh, going on these points and stuff, I, I keep thinking about uh, like roaring like the lion, you know, the, like the woke mob, and how you have to think a certain way. And and I keep thinking to myself, it's like if if that woke society got everything they wanted, would they really be happy? No. No. Nothing is ever enough. Like the like. You can see Satan all in that, you know, the, they they cry the most, you know, but but like for us, I mean, since we're refraining from that kind of stuff, it's the evil is never, it's, it's wanting power, nothing is ever good enough. They're never going to get what they want, even if they get what they want. But for us, all we want is to do is to get in heaven. So at least our path is more focused. And I, I, th I think that's why it's so important. We're framing the appearances of evil because we're more, we are more focus driven. You know, it's like we have to block out everything they're doing. It's like we're never, we can try to try, we can try and try, but nothing's ever going to be good enough. All, you know, we, we just got to try to keep it straight, stay focused, and hope that some other people, you know, mm -hmm. around the earth <laughs> that's focused on the earth can follow suit. There was someone who did that. They had everything they wanted. Everything. Mm -hmm. Never did enough. Yeah. Vanity, vanity. All is vanity. Chasing after the wind. If Never. you haven't read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's a, actually it's a good book to read. If you read it through the first time, you're going to be depressed. <laughs> you can pursue that next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and if you read it through the next, the second time, it starts to make a little bit of sense. <clears throat> and by the time you read it through the third time, you've already got a foundation laid, and it says, "Yeah, that's what this is all about." Remember that house that you bought? When you're dead and gone, what's going to happen to that house? Okay, the job that you have. All right, when you retire or you leave. What's going to happen to all the work you put into that job? Somebody else is going to do it. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, it goes on and on. It's okay. Chronic complainers. The yeah. ones who run out of things to complain about, you'll find something else to complain about. Yeah, you'll find somebody else who, hey, you're not happy unless you complain. I, I think, you know, I get, when I, you know, when I read uh, different versions of Scripture, to me, the word here. From is avoidance. You know, we, we evil is all around us. Mm -hmm. uh, you, how do how do you not see it? How is it not here? <coughs> you, know, you avoid. You know, like we talked about, when do most robberies and, and things like that happen at night? Okay, where do most of the drunk people come from? Most of them from bars. Mm -hmm. So avoidance, you know, is is key and. 
because it's surrounding us constantly. You know, turn the television off, please. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you, know, you can't stay away from it. it just upsets you. you know, it upsets me. I, I look at it like, how, how did we get here? How did we get so <laughs> far? You know, from from the truth, from right, that we can we come out of this? Well, not everybody can, or not everybody everybody can, not everybody will. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's it's up to us to be an example of of. We're trying as hard as we can to avoid this evil. You know, please, yeah. Mm -hmm. if, there, if it's a person in your life that's causing the evil, you, you know, you have you have to avoid that mm -hmm. particular person or that particular situation. Well, that's you know that's interesting because as we deal with as as folks who have had a uh, addiction issue, what they have to do to get out of it is they have to change mm -hmm. their friends. They have to get away from those people who are influencing them because <coughs> if they go back to them, they're going to go right back to where they were. And uh, we see that all the time, all the time. Pam, you dealt with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so um, as Christians, our friends have to change. We were in the world. Yeah. It, 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 it's so hard today because today it's now... Feelings are facts, and facts make you evil. You know, <laughs> it seems, and that's that's really hard to come around. It's like, listen, these these are this is the truth. This is there's no other truth other than this, and it's like, no, <laughs> this is not how I feel. That's your truth. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you've made a commitment when you accepted Jesus. You've made a commitment, and how are you living? Are you living in that commitment, mm -hmm. or? Are you going back to your old ways? Or, or are you straddling the fence and don't work? You know, and are you still growing? Yeah. Constantly. Awesome. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I think what he's saying here is in a sense that awaken. <coughs> you gotta grow up. <coughs> Quit fighting about these trivial things. And he goes into that a little bit in uh, 14. Yeah, I think we all get we all get stagnant. Over things, you know, we just kind of, you know, okay, this is good, we're, we're fine. You know, we gotta, yeah, routine. Yeah, we gotta just keep. You know, what did, what did I do wrong yesterday? Don't do that again. What did, you know, this kind of thing. Well, how can I grow from that? You know, and yeah, it, it is it is a struggle, but it's one that we need to make. What an athlete is training. What gives that athlete? Strength to compete. Commitment and perseverance. Uh huh. Exercise. Exercise. You're stressing the body. You get in the game. You're not just practicing. Right. That's it. Well, you know, and the other thing is, uh, you know, I've you know, followed sports all my life, and you all, you know, you have these guys that are, you know, you hear about them when they're in college, or you watch them, and they're they're really good, and you think, man, this guy's going to be great. Well, then comes that injury, that that. It's not debilitating, but it does change who they are. They have to be able to get over that and, and put the focus somewhere else. You know, whether it's even still in the, in the game of sports or athletes or whatever, athletics, and they still have to, they want to compete, but they're not going to be the same as they were because- They have to adjust. Yeah, adjust, yeah. You know, and that's- it Takes a lot of stamina, <laughs> takes a lot of perfection of the craft. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, you know, how do you, you know, you can't, especially, let's say, in the game of football. I mean, you know, it's a violent sport. Mm -hmm. at, you know, at any given time, you know, that guy that came out of college and was a superstar, it can be done. It can be wiped out. You've seen the ones that, you know, paralyze people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not only are they no longer an athlete, but they have trouble now <coughs> even coping with being you know, alive and a human being. Or just being a Browns quarterback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with, oh, yeah. with those stresses, how does that, how does that uh, apply to us as Christians? If it's used right, it's going to make us stronger. Correct. And if but, we make mistakes, how do you not, how do you avoid those mistakes? How do you avoid that? You're God always studying, first. you're always perfecting your craft. You're, yeah. It never stops. So you have catastrophes, <laughs> you have setbacks, 
you, you're tempted and you give in and you fall. But you still believe. How do we overcome that? We continue on. We keep going. We get up. We brush ourselves off. And we keep doing it. We swear. We see his example. This example I talk about this all the time. His example in the garden. What he went through. He tried to get out of it to a degree, but he realized he couldn't. He had to go through with it. Mm -hmm. And then when he hung on the cross, we have to put this in perspective and realize that's for each one of us personally and to love him because of that. That's the, to me, that's my drawing card. That's what draws me. That doesn't mean anybody else is like me. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a weirdo. Uh, but that's what keeps me on the road going. And, and it was in the sermon last week that uh, we follow God because he is who he is. I think that's the way it went. Something of that nature. Because he's worth following or Worshiping. Mm -hmm. What did Jesus? What did Jesus say we are to do? <coughs> Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. Yeah, daily, daily. We got to bear the weight of that cross, but bearing the weight of that cross increases our faith. It makes us grow deeper and deeper and deeper in Christ because of His example. I feel like he would just walk into one of these crowds and just like start to <coughs> talk to them. You know, just like, I mean, knowing what he'd done, who he talked to, mm -hmm. people that, you know, you wouldn't want to be associated with, I feel like you <coughs> Who did he associate with? Tax collectors. <laughs> uh-huh. Sinners. Sinners. So I feel um, like he just walked right into one of those crowds, like, hey, let's just have a, let's have a talk. And yeah, no matter what they're yelling or whatever, he'd poor. still just have a conversation with them. Yeah, he also associated with the poor. Yeah. Yeah. He said it was preached even to the poor. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, the religious leaders looked down upon him because who he was associated with. In other words, they elevated themselves. And this is, what, this is what Paul is trying to tell us. And Jesus told us the same thing. Paul is just emulating what was taught. The other part of this is, but well, we are also to refrain from those supposedly Christian activities which are carried out in the flesh. What Christian activities? What are we talking about here? Now, this is... This is another author. But sometimes, as a young Christian, you could fall into this. As a, as a mature Christian, and you just, nah, that's just what I do. And then one of them is praise of men and the gratification of self. Okay? Can you see, can you see what happens here? Why did you preach that sermon? You did a great job. You, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as, a, as a medical professional, you do a great job. <coughs> Got to put a pin in the door and let out some of that air so my head don't get too big. Okay. Gratification of self. So we have to watch those pitfalls. Our religious activities should not be for the praise of man or for self-elevation, but so that our heart and our mind is nourished and enlivened by his word, his righteousness, and his spirit. That's why we do it. I think this is well written here. Our, our activities for Christ, it's to, not, it, it's to enliven our hearts, but to give him all the honor, the glory, and the praise. You put so many hours in this. Why? Because I love it. What do you get out of it? Strength. We're probably going to have to stop here and then go into 14 next week. Questions, comments, posers, aggravations, instigations. I can't remember how Jake said it. So he's saying all this to lead up to 14. We get into 14, he's actually talking about 
No, if I hit the other slide. Well, wait a minute. There, 14, the principles of conscience and the Christian liberties. And that carries over into 15. But next week we'll cover 14 and then get into, I think 15 is a continuation of 14, but it's all based on one foundation and one four letter word. Love. Love. And again, we're not talking about the fuzzy feeling that you get inside. If we're talking about a decision. No matter what, I still love you. I disagree with you, but I still love you. And sometimes it's hard for us to separate. As parents, our children do things that we're really, really upset with. Do we still love them? I think that's a form of love that, that God showed, shows for his children, for his creation. He still loves them. And he is long-suffering. But there is going to come a time in these last days that he's going to have to punish and judge. So, Eric, could you close with a prayer, please? Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come here and learn from your word. We ask you for strength. We ask you for your wisdom to help us in everyday life that we can stay focused on what truly matters, your love and help and gain us into heaven by using your love as an example and spread it around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bing.